All right, doing something a little bit different today. A video by Neil Haloran. This is the first video I've done from him. It's the Fallen of World War II. I'm obviously in immense amount of deaths in the world wars. Um, I'm curious to see kind of how he breaks this up and talks about it. I've talked about this on a number of different videos. The, the contemporary sources from World War I and World War II from people fighting in the war are just absolute horror shows. They are just so brutal. Um, remember, if you like the channel, want to support what we're doing over here, you can like, comment, subscribe. I'll put the link to the Discord in the description box down below if you want to join some of the historical conversations going on over there. But with that being said, let's jump into it. The average lifespan of an American is 80 years. And an 80-year-old today was 10 when World War II ended, 4 when it began. A soldier who saw battle would have to be in his late 80s, at least today. Generals, political leaders, the decision makers of the war, few are still with us. And over the past few decades, we've seen authors and filmmakers rush to capture stories from survivors before this connection of memory is lost. I've talked about this on a previous video. My grandfather fought in World War II. He fought in the Pacific. He saw one of the atomic bombs before it was dropped. I know almost nothing about it. He died when I was decently young, certainly too young to attempt to pick his brain about any of this. However, I've heard a little bit from my mother, my grandmother, but honestly, they both kind of say the same thing. He didn't really talk about it. If he ever referenced the military, it was a general, um, you know, being in the military or somebody that he, 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 you know, knew or was friends with or whatever, never really any specifics, um, never really talked in depth about anything that he did, saw, you know, anything like that. Um, yeah, they said he just did not open up about it very often. This project is not about individual war stories, and it's not about survivors. We're going to tally up the tens of millions of people whose lives are cut short by the war and see how these numbers stack up to other wars in history, including trends in recent conflicts. We'll be counting soldiers and civilians separately. Each of these figures represents 1,000 people who died. Civilians were of all walks of life. Whereas military deaths were almost entirely men. The average age was about 23. In most battles... That is such a shitty part about the two world wars. You basically are wiping out a generation. Because the, a lot of the people fighting are young. They have their whole lives ahead of them. I can't even really comprehend it. Because when you're young, you're so jaded. You know, I'm still decently young. And I can't, I just can't imagine <clears throat> being put into a conflict with things that I don't understand, powers far outside my control, and, and basically just trying to put my head down and get through it. Just what a bizarre, what a bizarre world. For every 1,000 soldiers killed, there are more than a thousand who are injured. The word casualty can be confusing because in military speak, it often includes both deaths and injuries and anything yeah. else that takes a soldier out of service. Here, we're just counting the deaths and we'll begin with American soldiers. Over 400,000 died. Most of the deaths occurred in the European theater, fighting the Nazis. And about a quarter were in the Pacific, fighting the Japanese. When you put them on the timeline, you see that casualties were the heaviest at the end of the war. 
The war began on September 1st, 1939. But the U.S. wasn't willing to join the fight until Pearl Harbor, two years in. The deaths increased drastically on D-Day, when the Allies invaded Normandy. One of the most tragic moments of the war was on D-Day at Omaha Beach, where 2,500 Americans fell. So about the same number of U.S. soldiers died on this single beach landing as the entire 13 years of the recent war in Afghanistan. The bloodiest battle in the Pacific was Okinawa, which lasted 82 days, during which 12,500 Americans died. About 5,000 of these deaths were at sea from kamikaze attacks. Now let's look at some other countries, starting with Europe. Germany started World War II when it invaded Poland. Poland ultimately lost 200,000 soldiers in the war. Most died after the invasion while the country was occupied by Germany and the Soviet Union. Polish resistance, god damn, that's a lot of people. Germany, meanwhile, lost just 16,000 in the invasion of Poland. The Nazis went on to invade and conquer other countries, including Denmark, Belgium, the Netherlands, France, Greece, and Yugoslavia. France surrendered, but after losing 92,000 soldiers in the Battle of France. Over 200,000 ultimately fell, which includes deaths in POW camps, French colonies, and other fighting. Yugoslavia suffered almost half a million military deaths. The initial invasion brought relatively few casualties on both sides. But the deaths mounted under Nazi occupation due to guerrilla fighting, civil conflict, and mass executions. The Nazi invasions were swift, with relatively few German losses. Even the Nazi commanders expressed surprise at their success. And then we have the United Kingdom and the United States, who were not invaded, but took the fight to the Nazis. Britain lost about the same number of soldiers as the US, which includes the British colonies. Germany lost about half a million soldiers fighting the US and Britain in what is known as the Western Front, which took place in France and Belgium. Yeah, that was considered the lighter of the two fronts, though. The Eastern Front was known to be particularly brutal. But most Nazi soldiers died in the Eastern Front. Germany's unsuccessful invasion of the Soviet Union. The numbers are staggering. The most famous battle of the Eastern Front, and perhaps the turning point of the European war, was Stalingrad. The German 6th Army successfully took Stalingrad, but then got surrounded by the Soviets and cut off from food and ammunition. Half a million Nazis would ultimately die in Stalingrad. Another 100,000 were taken prisoner, of which 6,000 would ever return. POWs had a low survival rate throughout World War II, and it was particularly grim in the East. When you include these POWs, roughly the same number of Germans died in Stalingrad as all the Western Front fighting against France, the UK, and the US. And though Stalingrad was a victory for the Soviets, they suffered almost twice as many losses as Germany. The Soviet Union would eventually defeat the once unstoppable German army, killing 2.3 million Nazi soldiers. I do not want to take away from what the, the Soviets were able to do in World War II. However, just for general perspective, remember, the Soviets see manpower as another one of their resources. They, they treat it like it is another one of their resources, like it is oil or rifles or ammo or, you know, it's... It's another resource, and the numbers very much reflect that. But winning the war came at a cost. 
Jesus. Eight point seven million is the official tally by the Russian military, a hotly disputed number. Some studies have calculated as many as fourteen million dead. To complete the count of European military deaths, we need to add German deaths from other fronts, including the North and Africa, as well as deaths from other Axis powers allied with the Nazis, Hungary, Romania, and Italy. When you put these European military deaths on the timeline, it looks like this. You can now interact with the chart to learn more. Pause the narration if you'd like more time. And now we switch to civilian deaths in Europe. Six million Jewish people were killed in the Holocaust. If you separate this by country, you see that about half, 2.7 million, were Polish. 700,000 were Soviets, followed by Hungary and 17 other countries. Broken down another way, about half of the six million were killed in the concentration camps. Over a million died in Auschwitz. Most were killed in the gas chambers. Others died from starvation, exhaustion, disease, and other forms of execution. The second most deadly camp was Treblinka, which was exclusively an extermination camp, set up to look like a train station. Mobile killing groups killed 1.4 million Jews. Like with the gas chambers, men were killed first to reduce the risk of revolt. Again, I've talked about this on other videos. If you haven't read the book Ordinary Men, it it is an incredible perspective into how normal, everyday German men could wake up in a place where they could do some of the things that they were doing. The Holocaust also includes non-Jewish deaths. Between 130,000 to 500,000 Roma, then called gypsies, were killed. The numbers are disputed. About a quarter million people with disabilities were killed. Homosexuals, Catholics, and other groups were also exterminated, but their numbers were relatively small. Some historians say that other civilian deaths should go under the label of Holocaust. About two million non-Jewish Poles were killed under German occupation. Some of it were sent to the gas chambers at Auschwitz. Yep. When you combine civilian and military deaths, over 16% of the total Polish population died in World War II, which is the highest percentage of any country but not the highest in total death count. The Soviet Union again tops that list, losing at least as many civilians as it did soldiers, somewhere between 10 and 20 million. A particularly dark moment for the Soviet Union was the siege of Leningrad, now St. Petersburg. German forces surrounded Leningrad before civilians could be evacuated. Supplies, including food, were cut off for two and a half years. One and a half million people died as a result, mostly from starvation, mostly civilians. Stalin's cruelty towards his own people is partly responsible for these numbers. He often didn't allow civilians to evacuate from cities, thinking it would cause the soldiers protecting them to fight harder. About a million... Yeah, and was using them... Yeah, he absolutely did not go out of his way to help them in a lot of situations. And Soviets died in Stalin's own labor camps called the Gulag. Just about every country suffered civilian losses, especially countries who were invaded. While many died as a result of so-called collateral damage, the biggest numbers occurred when it was no accident. Civilians were exterminated, purposely fired upon or bombed, used as human shields, or intentionally deprived of food. The intentional killing of civilians was done by most warring parties, including the United Kingdom and the United States. The United Kingdom was spared of a land invasion, 
but still lost 60,000 civilians, largely from German air raids or blitzes, often directed at civilian population centers. The UK did this. Yeah, which actually was Germany shooting itself in the foot. Same to German cities at a much greater magnitude, causing about 10 times the number of deaths. But most German civilian deaths came from the ground at the late stage of the war. When the Nazi regime collapsed, civilians living in occupied regions had to desperately flee from the advancing Soviet army. Rapes were widespread, and death estimates ranged from 600,000 to 3 million. Let's step back and see where we are with the totals. We just counted about 20 million civilian deaths in Europe. Damn! If you add this to the European military deaths we already covered, it brings us to over 40 million. Then we have the Asian theater. Here we see the vast majority of military deaths in Asia came from China and Japan. On the civilian side, about 6 million deaths from China, Indonesia, Korea, Indochina, and the Philippines can be attributed to Japanese war crimes, which are sometimes compared to the Nazi atrocities due to the sheer scale of the cruelty. Yeah, and in a lot of cases aren't brought up with the other German atrocities, which is something I don't totally understand. China had the second highest death count after the Soviet Union. And like the Soviets, the Chinese government demonstrated a stunning willingness to sacrifice its own people. Chinese nationalists opened the dike at the Yellow River, hoping the flood would halt the Japanese advance. Half a million Chinese civilians or more were killed which is two or three times the number who died in all countries in the 2004 Asian tsunamis. But the invasion of China only cost Japan 200,000 soldiers. Most were killed fighting the US and allies in the Pacific War. A significant portion of Japanese civilian deaths were caused by American firebombing and the two nuclear attacks. Contrary to official US statements, these airstrikes were directed at civilian populations, not military targets. Yeah, General uh, Curtis LeMay, dick. When you add all the deaths outside of Europe, it brings us to a grand total of 70 million for the war, give or take depending on who's counting and what civilian deaths get included. More people died in World War II than in any other war in history. For comparison, here are 20 or so of the very worst wars and atrocities we have on record. Some of these are more of atrocities than wars, but we've seen how that distinction can get blurry. Some of these numbers are hotly, hotly debated. Some of these spanned across centuries. World War II had the highest body count, and it all happened in just six years. The world's population has grown significantly since the earliest atrocities on this list. If you want to compare them in terms of what percentage of the world died, we can adjust the chart to look like this. This rough approximation tells us there may have been more devastating wars before World War II, proportionally speaking. When we turn to post-war conflicts, it's hard to say anything that isn't controversial. But the data shows something quite extraordinary has been happening. In 1989, John Gaddis coined the phrase, the long peace, to identify the absence of conflict between the nuclear powers during the Cold War. 25 years later, the Cold War is over, and the term is still being used, although its meaning may have shifted. European countries have not fought each other, except for this 10-day war in 1956, when the Soviet Union invaded Hungary. This obviously was put together before the Ukraine invasion. When we look at European wars before World War II, it looks like this. They tend to be more frequent as you go back, though smaller in scale. And the largest 44 economies of the world have not battled each other since World War II. Rich countries have fought poorer countries, like the US versus Iraq. But rich countries have not fought other rich countries. Such a period of peace between the so-called great powers hasn't been seen since the Roman Empire. To many, peace is too strong of a word. Wars have occurred since World War II. 
and they can be grouped into these four categories. We don't see colonial wars anymore. We've already noted that interstate wars between rich countries have not occurred at all. And here we see wars involving smaller economies have tapered off. That leaves civil wars of two types, with and without foreign intervention. And this is what these battle deaths look like alongside of World War II. More people died fighting in World War II than in all the wars since. And again, we can't forget about world population, which has almost tripled since World War II. If we scale these numbers to show deaths in proportion to world population, showing the likelihood that a person on Earth dies in battle, the downward trend becomes even more pronounced. Now this isn't to infer anything about why this trend is occurring. That's a discussion for another day. You can now interact with this chart to explore what conflicts are behind the totals. Now bear in mind we're just looking at battle deaths here, not civilian deaths, but those two are in decline. What do y'all think about this, about the this period of peace here? Because I tend to be of the opinion not that it's overblown, that's the wrong way to put it, but there have been periods of at least somewhat stability and peace historically where I tend to kind of jump off this bandwagon is the idea that we have somehow moved past that. That the idea of like general wars and great powers fighting each other is just a thing of the past. I think that is an incredibly naive perspective of humans in general. That seems wildly naive to me. Um, and there have been countries that have been shaping policy based on this idea that, that those things are just a thing of the past. I, I just, I don't know, that seems wildly optimistic to me. Peace is a difficult thing to measure. It's a bit like counting the people who didn't die in wars that never happened. We give such importance to the word peace, but we don't tend to notice it when it occurs or report on it. Sometimes it takes reminding ourselves of how terrible war once was to see the peace that has been growing around us. Of course, this trend may not continue. And it's not clear how looking at these charts can help us make the right decisions to ensure that it does. But the longer the long peace grows, the more significant it becomes. So if watching the news doesn't make us feel hopeful about where things are heading, watching the numbers might. Good video. This was the fallen of World War II. Yeah, the the death counts, the stories, the perspectives from both of the world wars are just absolute insanity. They are absolute insanity. But again, I I want to know what you all think about this relative stint of peace here. Um, why is it the case? How long will it remain? Do you agree with the idea that we have just somehow moved past that? We have evolved or enlightened ourselves onto a new like plane of thinking? What, where do y'all fall on that? Um, really good video. As always, like, comment, subscribe. Help me keep building the channel out of here. And uh, I'll get the next Swedish Ranger series out either later today or tomorrow. And I'll see you all then.